everyone. So uh, this was a bit of a last minute fill in talk. So as some of you know, I spent a good chunk of the past few years writing this brick of a book. Uh, and I'm going to basically go through a demo from the book. It's from the chapter on interactivity. Uh, and it's uh, basically building up a little game. So to jump ahead and uh, so this is what we're creating. It's a little game, things moving around, you clip on them and there's a timer running out and panic, 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 you're running out of time and I'm using somebody else's trackpad, so I'm not doing very well, but that's the game. It's very simple. It's done as a book demo, so I'm not adding in lots of complication. You notice there was no start game button. There is no reset button. If you want to pay a new game, you refresh the page. Um, if you do want to pay or play the game, uh, that's the URL, or I've bitlified it, or it's on my Twitter, and as a response to the uh, uh, Edmonton JS Twitter, so you can find it if you would like to play it again. It's not very complicated, but it gets in a few of the interesting things of working with SVG. And if you program any sort of graphical game web app, uh, a lot of the basics are going to be the same. But there are some things that are more convenient when you're working with SVG compared to when you're working with a Canvas uh, thing because the SVG has a DOM. So all of those objects are elements that can accept individual events separate from the overall screen. And uh, there are also extra DOM methods that are baked in that are good for dealing with the math side of graphics. And so I'm going to be going through source code um, in a couple iterations. So our first version of the game is going to be a little simpler. It's just going to have dots, and the dots don't move. But otherwise, you collect the dots, and the time runs out. So, pretty much the same, actually, no, you know what, I want to open that up and then look at it in DevTools, and let's close a couple panels here, crank up the font size, so, uh, Starting at the basics, um, can we using somebody else's computer? Ah, there it is. So here's our that's our script. Here's the basic uh, markup that gets sent down the line. So it's an actually SVG file. Most of this stuff would work this exact same way if it was inline SVG in an HTML file. Uh, I'm setting things up. I've got it as a fixed width because this was a demo for a book and I wanted the figures all a nice fixed width. But if you were doing this properly, you'd do it responsive. Um, I've got a bunch of styles that are plunked in there, but the only other markup in there is are the text elements. And if you notice, there's an individual text element, or technically a T-span element, which is a text span. It's just the SVG element for a span of text. Uh, for the exact numbers that I'm going to be updating so that I can easily update them without worrying about the surrounding text. So yes, the markup that comes down the wire is pretty basic. Everything interesting happens in the game. Uh, this is designed to be um, one on all browsers. So it's uh, ES5, JavaScript, very basics. But these bunch at the top are 
effectively constant, setting up my scalable size of the board, what I'm doing, and grabbing uh, those elements that were created in the markup. We've got a global variable for the score. And then what we're, are we actually doing? We're drawing a bunch of circles. So SVG, a circle is a circle element. Um, the only really complicated thing there, assuming you have done some vanilla DOM scripting, is that we're using namespace sensitive DOM methods. Everything DOM scripting in SVG has to use the namespace sensitive methods even if you're running in an HTML page. Otherwise, you'll get an element that has the tag name circle, and in your DOM inspector, it'll look like this, and you'll have all these circle elements with all the right attributes, and on the screen, you'll have absolutely nothing, because they won't be SVG circle elements, they'll just be generic circle elements, and the browser doesn't know how to draw this generic circle element. So that's the um, only complicated thing. Everything else is vanilla JS. We're setting a class. The R attribute is the radius of the circle. Fill is the color. I've got a little function to generate a random color. Uh, you can see down here. Is this big enough? Would you like me to make it a bit bigger again? Yeah. So random color using HSL notation, which makes it easier to get nice looking random colors rather than random grays and browns and mud. You can sort of control, it needs to be a saturated color and it needs to be in the right range of lightness. Um, and CX, CY are the X and Y positions of the center of the circle randomized based on my width and height that I'm using. And the rest of the game at this stage is pretty basic. I'm counting down a timer using a set interval every 100 milliseconds to update it. And I am, oh yeah, I'm listening for click events. I'm listening for click events on the SVG as a whole and uh, down here in check clink, I'm finding which actual element was the target. Again, because all my circles are objects in the DOM, I don't have to worry about hit testing and uh, any uh, math at this point. I'm just, which element was hit, the browser tells me. And was it one of the ones that was supposed to be clickable? Okay, it's now been clicked. Update the score. And the only thing in there is that I'm updating my time, when it ends, I set a new class and that changes the styles so that, well, in that case, it's all blacked out, but uh, if I actually had played the game and it would count down and, so right now, every time I click, I'm just changing a class, things go transparent and then it changes class on the parent element and the colors just flip. So it's a nice way to switch from the stages just with a couple clicks. So that was the basic game. As I said, it pretty vanilla stuff, not a lot of SVG specific thing. Um, we go up one level in complexity and we switch from basic circles to these little fancy drawings of gemstones. So the gameplay is exactly the same, clicking around. It's just the pictures look a little nicer. So uh, open that one up in the dev tools. So markup looks much the same, except we've got this extra block called defs. And defs in SVG is definitions, chunk of markup you're defining for later use. What I'm defining is a nested SVG element. So a nested SVG just creates a graphic within your graphic that has its own coordinate system. Uh, if you've used SVG, you might also be familiar with the symbol element. Um, 
a predefined nested SVG is very similar to a symbol, but with the extra benefit that it has default width and height attributes and X and Y offsets, which uh, are going to make it easier to just create many, many copies of this graphic, all the same size and all positioned relative to their center point, because I've got a uh, set it to 16 by 16 square, but offset by eight and eight from wherever I tell it to draw it. So it ends up being drawn centered over whatever point I tell it. So that's pretty straightforward. The rest of the markup is the same. Uh, on the scripting side, to deal with use elements instead of uh, circle elements, there are a couple extra complications. Uh, so the attributes change, we're now making a use element and we're setting it with a href cross-reference to the uh, ID of our predefined SVG. Uh, that is unfortunately another namespace thing. Uh, most browsers now will support that attribute without the namespace, but Safari still doesn't, so we have to use, again, namespace versions. and. It's now X and Y instead of CX and CY, but other than that, I've kind of set it up so it's all pretty much the same. There is only one other complication, and that has to do with how the use elements actually appear in the DOM. So when I add a use element into my SVG that says, take that graphic over here and draw it here. Whatever markup I'm pointing to, use that to draw something here. So that is represented in the DOM using something that basically is the same as the way Shadow DOM works in Web Components. Shadow DOM and Web Components was inspired by use elements. So if you're not familiar, that basically means there's a separate DOM tree with copies of all these elements that uh, exist. and all these elements are the actual things being drawn and actual things you're clicking on. And while there's different versions because there's how it was originally designed in SVG and how it's defined now with Shadow DOM, but in the original SVG, the shadow wasn't full elements, but they were still a tree of nodes which were valid event targets. And so when you clicked on something, your event target would be this shadow node instead of your main element uh, in your DOM. And that turned out to be very problematic and confusing for people who didn't see these elements and where, where is this event target coming from. Um, so Shadow DOM now in Web Components, it has this idea that when events bubble out of your Shadow DOM and into your Light DOM, the event.target property gets reassigned so that if you have an event handler on your use element or up here on the SVG element, which is where we're listening for events, that event handler sees that event coming from the use element instead of coming from one of these polygon shapes in the shadow which is very useful and convenient, except there are still some browsers out there who haven't updated it, and they still, uh, it's basically only Internet Explorer now, but Internet Explorer still implements the old one where it has these other nodes, and so it really comes down to a one-line fix, which is those shadow nodes had a property called corresponding use element that linked back to the real DOM element. And so if it has that property, then we use that property to find the use element. Otherwise, we assume the browser is already taken care of that and we're just using event target. So it's a one-line fix, but if you don't know about this fix, this will drive you nuts whenever you're dealing with any sort of click event handling and use elements and why is it broken on Internet Explorer. But beyond that, this is pretty uh, much the same game. It's just a couple little fixes to deal with use elements instead of uh, plain old circles. So then we go up to 
advanced mode. So this is what I showed to start with and just uh, refresh so you recall. Now our gems are floating around and actually there's another thing going on which is where I click randomly, I've got a little marker that says, whoops, you missed, there was something there that uh, just a little trigger sign. So there's a couple things going on and I should maybe have split that up into, I've got a different version of the game with one of those features and not the others, but that's okay. We'll go through the uh, code. So let's, what have we got here? Uh, skip the CSS, go with the markup. So, markup is the same as the last one, and why is it not showing me the JS? Okay. There it is. So, JS, our setup is the same. Uh, got a couple more elements in there. Uh, just a container for my misses. So those are the extra little circles that were showing up whenever I hit the background instead of hitting an element. So now instead of listening for clicks on elements, we're listening for clicks on the background and adding new elements. And so that was just in the markup. There's an extra group somewhere that is empty just waiting to hold them at the correct layering. So. And then the other thing is we're moving. So which one to talk about first? Well, we'll go in order. So the moving feature, I actually just changed this code today. So I didn't end up using the moving bit in the book. So I hadn't looked at it too closely. I looked at it and said, wait a moment, I'm not actually doing that. So the way I had it originally coded was I was just using the transform attribute and I was generating a long string that says translate by this value and that value and rotate by this other value. And then I was manually calculating all the updates, every t animation frame that this is how much that number changed and creating a new string setting it to the attribute, browser parses that string, and then draws. But there's actually a SVG DOM representation of uh, the transform object as a DOM object. I will tell you right now, it's part of an SVG DOM that isn't designed in a very user-friendly manner. So uh, the dot transform is the representation of the attribute, but then it has a base value and that becomes a transform list object, which creates, has an object for each command in your transform. So a translate command, a rotate command, and then each of those transform objects has an SVG matrix object attached and it's the SVG matrix objects that we're actually going to be using. So. If anybody's really interested, I can help explain this at some point. There's lots of features. You need to work in MDN to kind of go through all the possibilities. Uh, the one thing I will warn you is that to confuse you more, you go to a lot of these pages on MDN and they say it's deprecated. And that's because, uh, there, well, oh, fine. Yeah, So most of these APIs were defined in SVG1, but as you know, transforms are now available in CSS for all elements. So they've been redefined, not as SVG matrix, but as DOM matrix. So even though MDN says it's deprecated, the SVG matrix is supported everywhere. And some places they also support these extra methods which are defined as DOM matrix and which has support for 3D and other things. But the basic SVG1 is supported everywhere. 
And to go why it's useful, so I'm setting a transform. I'm consolidating it into a single object that I'm keeping track of the matrix for. And then I'm assigning each of these elements a uh, random velocity, x, y, and angular velocity. And when I update it, I don't have to do any math, almost. I'm saying velocity times delta chip time, so there's a bit of math there. But the matrix math is all done by the browser. I say, take that matrix you were working with, transform it by this amount additional change, and rotate it by this amount additional change, and then reset that as the value of the transform on this object. And yeah, I know this is not the easiest to understand, but it's just, it's updating the transform on a uh, ongoing basis without uh, having to turn it all into a string and then back out of the string again and again. And I've just got an extra little check to make sure my objects don't go off screen. If they hit the bottom, velocity gets uh, multiplied by negative one, so they end up bouncing into the other direction. If you've done any sort of game mechanics, that's a uh, pretty standard. So what else is, uh, oh, the other thing that was new was the adding um, extra elements if you hit somewhere where there isn't an element. So when you hit an element, I was telling you didn't need to worry about hit testing and figuring out where on the screen you were. You just asked the browser which element was hit. But if you're hidden on the backdrop, then you need to figure out where on the backdrop do I want to draw my new element. So again, there's a few uh, extra methods with matrices that the browser does that you can use to convert your uh, mouse coordinates, which are attached to your event object, client X and client Y, and you throw in a few matrix methods and it gives you back a point object uh, or an updated point object which you can then use directly as your SVG coordinates for drawing the new object. Um, again, these are really powerful DOM interfaces that I'm not going to explain to you all in a few minutes, but uh, this particular bit of code is one that uh, you can copy and paste and just use converting mouse coordinates into screen coordinates is uh, something you have to do a lot in any sort of interactive graphics, whether it's uh, uh, games or data viz or whatever. Um, that's about all I wanted to quickly cover, but I know I threw a lot at you, so any particular questions we can take uh, five, ten minutes and go through them. There are, uh, yeah, so uh, one asked, are there high-level APIs and frameworks that are using these? Um, to a certain extent, some of the uh, graphics APIs like D3 use these, but for the most part, they just re-implement them themselves rather than using the DOM ones, and that goes back to browser support for the DOM methods didn't used to be very great, and uh, goes into the frameworks want to be adaptable and use the same code for Canvas and SVG. So um, I think there are a few out there that make it a little easier, but uh, at a certain point for stuff like the matrix math, you have to use those uh, objects and learn them. Any other? Casey? That is a good qu uh, question. So one, uh, the Casey's question was, what happens if you keep on increasing the number of shapes? So you have thousands or more objects. And that is something to worry about with 
SVG uh, compared to Canvas graphics is that all those shapes have DOM representations in memory and that eventually adds up. So like it comes up a lot in data viz where you have like a graph with uh, thousands of dots and the person viewing the graph just sees the overall cloud shape. But if you're drawing each dot as a separate circle, that's a lot of DOM elements in the memory. And uh, yeah, it's when you're doing interactive things like this, though, then you have to balance out how much are you saving by having the browser being able to do your hit testing for you. And uh, so there's, there's always uh, uh, some in between where the performance shifts from one to the other. And I would not worry on SVG up to 1,000 SVG elements once you start getting over a thousand, then really start uh, doing your performance testing. John. Um, so to, to get all the gems, you ended up using that, I think it's actually called the use. The use element, yes. Use, um, which kind of like takes an existing DOM element and seemed like it was reusing it. Um, is that more performant than just say, Yeah. So the question is, is the SVG use element uh, more performant than just doing uh, cloning? It doesn't seem to be really a lot more performant in modern browsers. So um, use element is conceptually useful that you just, you just deal with that top level. You don't have to run the cloning. Um, the way it was designed was the assumption that browsers would be able to save a lot of internal memory. How much they save in practice and implementation seems to vary. Um, certainly as far as rendering, you can change the styles on that use element. Like I'm changing, giving each one a different fill color and that's inheriting down into the individual polygons. I've got a base polygon in that color and then the rest of the fact is done by uh, transparent white triangles over top. But yeah, so it's not completely reusing it like it would reuse an image. It's recalculating styles and redrawing it. So it's people who are doing really complex animations where you want lots of copies, but you also want to be able to really control the internals of the copy and make them different from each other in different ways, then yeah, it's it's clone node all the way and just add it in. But there may be some performance improvement for use, but in current browsers, it doesn't seem to be a big difference. It's just uh, authoring convenience, really. I have one under, unrelated question, sort of like, when you're doing these little games and stuff like that, the art, if you, to kind of draw them yourself, or like if you didn't, is there a good place to get some of this art uh, that you can use to play around with? Uh, well, these uh, gems I did draw actually for a previous uh, example in the book, and then, oh, I can reuse that for this game. But there are a number of um, websites now that offer the part. Um, there's actually a chapter in the book about good sources for SVG. I'm trying to think of the name of the thing and realize it's right here. So open clip art library, and, but there are now lots. Vecdeasy is another one where they have, you know, from icons up to fancy clip art and um, different sites have different uh, copyright patterns and stuff. But yeah, you can usually, if you want to play around with graphics and you're not a designer, you can usually find bits and pieces of SVG and since it's all code, you just download it and maybe throw it through uh, Optimizer because if 
somebody's just saving code straight out of Adobe Illustrator, it's not always the nicest code to look at. So uh, SVG OMG is the uh, uh, optimizer, whoops, I uh, recommend. It's, uh, well, I don't have anything to, it's drag and drop your SVG and it'll give you all sorts of options to uh, clean things up. And then you take that code, you open it in your code editor and hey, it's markup. And there are a few confusions like dealing with XML namespaces, but uh, if you're familiar with JavaScript manipulating HTML, it's uh, not that big of a learning curve to move up to manipulating SVG. And uh, as I mentioned, I mean, these examples were standalone, so they were SVG files, but everything applies the same to uh, inline SVG. Any other questions? Thank you. Okay.